it would be a, a review which I would try to um, assess the uh, current knowledge about the uh, contribution of uh, specific environmental risk factors to autism as, as we know uh, that today. I, I want first to give some um, arguments about uh, the fact that there is um, evidence for or indirect evidence and direct evidence for the role of such environmental factors and I will review them one by one. And then at the end I will give a kind of summary of what do we know about uh, the contributions of these factors today, what are the methodological issues that needs to be uh, tackled in the next generation of studies to uh, get that field uh, more uh, going than it is currently. So, okay. The first, the, the first um, argument which is always uh, proposed to say, well, it cannot be all genetic is uh, coming from the twin studies. And you can see here two of the major twin studies, but I will probably refer to, oh, to the, um, the, the one from the UK by uh, Tony Bele, Michael Rutter, and this group, which showed, if you look at the yellow bar, the yellow bar is the proportion of MZ twins which are concordant for autism. So one is autistic, and then the question is how many of the other co-twins are autistic as well. And in that study, so it, was, it was close from 70%. Uh, in other studies, it's slightly higher, but the idea is that uh, it's not 100%. So, uh, uh, so uh, well, I should not worry about time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so another argument uh, in favor of the environmental uh, approach is to say, well, let's look at what has been the yield of genetic studies. And molecular genetic studies started in like in the early 90s uh, with big hopes that uh, critical genes would be found. And then like we are like 16 years uh, later, and there's been a quite disappointment uh, array of results based on the large linkage studies, which have been uh, informative but very inconsistent is what they, they yielded. More recent uh, approach to using like uh, genome-wide association studies also have, have led to somewhat uh, negative studies. There's been, uh, uh, however, a big uh, development in looking at more sporadic cases and de novo mutations and the, the whole concept of copy number variant which has emerged uh, five, six years ago has actually been applied with success to autism samples, and we now found uh, a number of micro deletions and duplications. But still, if you if you just sum that up, uh, it's still the case that depending to whom you talk, uh, but it's about anywhere between eight percent to twenty percent of cases of autism for which we have a genetic explanation. Which means that at this point in time. Uh, uh, still like 75%, 80% of children remain unexplained in terms of a possible genetic cause. Uh, so that opens up the idea that maybe uh, there are uh, the, the gene search is not uh, paying off and that we should look at other factors. Um, there is another argument which is sometimes put forward, which is to say, well, um, there is a lot of... Um, uh, variability in the in the phenotype, and for instance, if one looks at uh, MZ twin pairs, which are concurrent, so we have two pairs, which are uh, two twins, which are in the same pair, they are 100% uh, similar, and they do have autism, each of them. You can still have a huge variability in the phenotype between these two uh, subjects. So, for instance, in the in the UK uh, twin study. Uh, you could have pairs of MZ twins concordant for autism. One of them could have high IQ, uh, and then the other one could be very severely retarded. And you could have like an 80 points difference in IQ within the same pairs. Therefore, showing that part of the phenotype are, are not under tight genetic controls, and then maybe there are some environmental factors which explain uh, uh, part of the variance in the phenotype. And the same argument applies to the broader autism phenotype or the fact that discordant MZ twin pairs also show a different, um, uh, uh, different phenotypes, either autism or milder difficulties, and you can see that in the in relatives as well. And the argument is uh, sometimes to say, well, maybe uh, there are uh, other factors than genes which uh, explain the phenotype. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that I endorse these arguments, but they are put forward to, to uh, make a case for uh, environmental uh, studies. Uh, 
The next big uh, uh, approach is to say, if we look at the epidemiology, uh, this is a slide which summarizes the trends over time. You see the first studies starting in England for autistic disorder and then coming up to 2010, I think. And you could see that there is a progressive uh, regular increase in the rate of autistic disorder over uh, the last 40 years. And therefore, people say if it is increasing that fast, it means that it cannot be due to the genetic pool which cannot change so quickly and therefore there must be something happening in the environment which is driving up uh, this uh, rate. Uh, I'm just, I'm just use that opportunity to give you another study that we are just publishing in a month uh, and we too have experienced the fact that each time we do a study, it's two or three years later we have new rates and they tend to increase like Kathy Rice and others. So in that new study, we have a rate which is 0.8% uh, uh, compared to a rate on a similar type of design in Montreal of four years ago, but we had a rate of 0.65%. Yes, yeah. So it's, uh, it's increasing. And the uh, graphical display of this uh, study shows, you can see that the cohort uh, range from 1991 to 2002, and you can see this regular increase as we often find in this broad age range. There is something here which is interesting in, in that particular study, I don't know, uh, uh, actually it's a question for Kathy, that it seems to, uh, to be a bit plateauing in the, in the more recent course at around 1.3%. So it may be, uh, there might be other explanations, but I would like to know if you find the same trend in uh, US data. Um, now, uh, what do we think about these arguments? Well, it's not sufficient to argue that there is an environmental risk mechanism involved. Uh, the, the reason is that uh, the proportion of case which uh, uh, is now attributed to clearly uh, identified genetic causes has increased. So like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't know uh, that, for instance, 1% of autistic uh, subjects had chromosome 16 P11 uh, deletions or, or duplications. That's a very robust finding, like Shang 3. So we are accruing new knowledge and new findings which make actually a difference for families. And uh, this proportion is bound to increase. So uh, it's slow, but it's increasing. The second point is that uh, the, uh, the concordance in DZ twin pairs uh, is not very higher than wh uh, what you find for uh, sibling risk. And if there was a, a contribution of, uh, a strong contribution of environmental exposures, you would expect that DZ twins, because they are like siblings, but they share much more uh, of the common environment than the siblings, they should have more concordance than the siblings. It's not what we found. The sibling risk is currently estimated at about like 15%. And in, in twin studies, the DZ concordance rate has never been like more than 10, 15%. So it's, that doesn't argue for an environmental component. Then the, the, the fact that the, the phenotype is highly variable, as I described before, doesn't mean that it's uh, due to environmental factors. It could be due to uh, uh, different penetrants of the same uh, condition. And we see that in medicine where you can have in a family the same gene, like for instance Huntington disease gene, and people develop the, the, the disease at different ages uh, and with different uh, courses or different severities. So, the, this fact doesn't mean uh, environmental causation. And then what uh, we think about the increased rates of, of uh, autism in the epidemiological study is, of course, uh, subject to, uh, to discussion. Uh, I don't want to go back to all the discussions I had or I wrote <laughs> about why diagnostic substitution, etc. We, we all know that. I just want to make a point here, is that if you look at these uh, slides, it brings together data from the US, data from Japan, data from the UK, and data from Denmark, very different countries. And if you look at what happened, is that the increase actually is taking place at about the same time. So it happened like in the 90s. And if you think that, what can we think would be an environmental influence which would be operating in such very different contexts that we shall like miles apart, what would be that uh, environmental effect? It's hard to actually envisage such uh, 
the, uh, to postulate such a mechanism. So they're bound to be something which has a lot to do with the environment in these uh, upward trends. But of course, it's, it's a possibility that it, they, they also do exist. Okay, so now let's, I'm, I'm gonna go back to what we know, which is more like looking at positive evidence of a, of a risk of autism increase in relation to specific environmental experiences or exposures. Um, and I will review now first uh, four drugs, which have a class of mostly drugs which have been associated with increased risk of, of autism. And in fact, I did review again this whole literature, and it's very quite difficult to make good sense of it. But uh, the first thing is the thalidomide. Thalidomide was a medication which was uh, released in the 50s and 60s, uh, sold over the counter very like uh, loosely, and women were, or people were taking that to, to treat a range of things. Uh, vomiting during pregnancy was one of the reasons, but also to treat anxiety, uh, and it was uh, widespread at the time. And quickly people observed that there was a number of children born with increased uh, malformations, in particular limb malformations, and that led quickly to the discontinuation of this medication in 1962. But yet, uh, you had then 14,000 uh, deaths and then 6,000 live births of children neonates which had severe malformation. And they were studied, of course, uh, 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 by different people. And then uh, later, in, um, in, uh, in the 90s, 86 Swedish adults were uh, followed up at age 27, 29, and they were reviewed by ophthalmologists and other psychiatrists, and then it was found that four subjects uh, had an autism diagnosis, and it's important to know that they were all deaf and had somewhat severe mental retardation, uh, and uh, the interest of that particular study is showed that, they, of course, the, the, it's a raised rate of about 5%, uh, so, so 5 or 10 times increase in what you would expect based on, on uh, population uh, data. But the, the interest of this particular uh, story is that the thalidomide exposure has been uh, mapped to particular days at which the mothers took the medication. It's a, it's a teratogenic effect which is short-lived, and therefore, by looking at particular malformation in the offsprings, you could actually date the exposure in the course of the pregnancy in the weeks which followed conception. And the children who had uh, autism were apparently uh, all uh, exposed to uh, thalidomide in the very beginning of this sensitive period because none of them, or actually one of them, but let's say none of them had upper limb malformation. So, so it's really occurring uh, in relation to exposure, which are between days 20 to 24 of um, gestation. And that's really the, the interesting aspect of this story is that it's, it points at a particular time window at which a brain development in the fetus might be particularly uh, sensitive. Uh, the second drug is misoprostol. It's a prostaglandin, which is used to, uh, uh, for various indications in medicine, but it's used uh, loosely over the counter as a medication to induce self-abortion. And what happened is in the uh, 90s in Brazil, a lot of women were taking that, and there were like reports, case series of, uh, uh, because they were taking that, but it didn't work. So they, they actually, the pregnancies led to uh, birth of the children. And uh, in some, uh, there were some reports that uh, some of these children developed autism more than you would expect. So that uh, led to another uh, investigation in, in Brazil where people looked at uh, Mobius syndrome, which is a, uh, basically an, a, it's a complex uh, syndrome which is proteiform in its presentation that involves uh, uh, paralysis of particular cranial nerves. 